This video is sponsored by MyHeritage. MyHeritage is the top family history and DNA service, which helps you trace your roots throughout generations and explore the regions your ancestors called home. As a teacher and an avid true crime lover, I'm always trying to learn more about the true backstory of things. So my excitement grew when I received a user-friendly DNA testing kit from MyHeritage, allowing me to easily learn about my family's origins. So all I have to do is swab my inside cheek for 30 to 60 seconds. Before submission, I felt no hesitation as they adhere to the strictest confidentiality protocols in that they commit to never sell or transfer their user's data to any third party. After you swab your cheek, you put the swab in the vial and send the sample back to my Heritage's lab in the provided envelope. While you wait for your results, you can check out some of the photo features of my Heritage, where you can enhance, colorize, and even animate old family photos. Okay guys, so it's been a couple of weeks and now I have my DNA results in. I'm not sure what to think. I'm excited. I don't know why I'm nervous. It's so intense. I'm 38% Irish, 24% Greek and South Italian. Nine percent normal Italian. <laughs> this is exciting. Nine point two percent Mesoamerican and Andean, which makes sense because I was told I was Mexican. Nineteen percent other ethnicities. Okay, so it showed me the most prominent ethnicities are Irish and Greek and South Italian, which I know that my mom is half Italian, so that makes sense. I've also been told um, about my Mexican heritage, so I see that represented here. I wonder what the other ethnicities are. So I'm able to tell that not only am I the main ones that I um, mentioned, but I'm also part Iberian, which is from Spain, and then East European and a little bit Baltic. So that's my European ancestry. And then I have like some Mesoamerican and Native American, a tiny bit of Middle Eastern. What? I'm very surprised by that. I would not have expected that. And like a smidge of Central Asian, which is just a little smattering of that, which is fun. Um, I'm definitely surprised. I did not know that I'd have such strong Irish heritage mixed with such strong Italian heritage. And it definitely makes me feel like I wanna explore my roots a little bit more and just check out how those ancestries come together to form me. So thanks my heritage, this is really cool. If you're interested in finding out more about your family's origins, head to myheritage.com or click the link in the description below and use the coupon code MERC for free shipping. As an added bonus, you can start a 30-day free trial of MyHeritage's best subscription for family history research, and you can enjoy a 50% discount if you decide to continue it. Fawn Cox was a 16-year-old teenager living with her parents and two younger sisters in Kansas City, Missouri. Described as an extroverted and affectionate teen, Fawn enjoyed swimming and camping. She actively participated in church events and assisted her parents in looking after her younger siblings. Fawn, a junior at Northeast High School, had a boyfriend and worked as a cashier at a Kansas City amusement park called Worlds of Fun. On July 26, 1989, Fawn had been working late at the amusement park. After her shift was over, her mother and sister picked her up and brought her home around 11 p.m. She went straight to bed as she said she was tired and had to work the following day. Typically, Fawn's younger sisters, Amber and Felisa, would join her in sleeping upstairs in the adjacent room. However, due to the hot summer night and the lack of a functional air conditioner on the upper floor, Felisa opted to sleep downstairs while Amber was out babysitting. This left Fawn sleeping alone on the upper level of the house. The following morning, Fawn's alarm clock sounded at 9.30 a.m., intended to wake her for work. However, when Fawn did not turn off the alarm clock, her mother Beverly and her sister Felisa proceeded upstairs to investigate. Upon entering her room, they found a grisly sight. Fawn was laying dead in her bed. 
the family immediately notified police. Upon studying the crime scene, police surmised that the killer had gotten into the house through an open upstairs window, possibly by climbing on top of a trailer which had been parked there. Her father used the trailer for work and it was always parked in that location. Upon entering her bedroom, the killer sexually assaulted her and strangled her with a nightgown which was taken from Amber and Felice's room. Fawn's family told police they had not heard anything that night. The sound of their loud air conditioner had masked any noise coming from upstairs. Felisa told police that their family dog was acting agitated and had barked between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m., but she had believed it was due to the dog's pregnancy. According to Fawn's sister, Amber Cox's post on websleuths.com, several items from the house were missing, including two radios, a Nintendo game console, and a stereo recorder. Amber also mentioned that some belongings had been displaced from the closets in the adjacent room, leading detectives to suspect that the perpetrator had been hiding there. It is believed that the intruder gained entry into the house while Fawn's father was asleep, and while her mother and sister were away picking her up from her workplace. Police believed that the killer or killers had known the family and were familiar with the house layout. Police collected several pieces of evidence from the crime scene, including blood and semen samples. Detectives launched an investigation and questioned friends, family, and neighbors, but nothing significant came of it. Soon, a witness came forward and placed three teenagers who belonged to a gang called Ninth Street Dog at the scene of the crime. However, the witness, for unknown reasons, later recanted their statement. Nonetheless, police arrested the individuals identified as Christopher A. Yates, Leonard C. Cruces, and Timothy E. Roberts and questioned them. One of the suspects, it is unclear who, confessed to being at Fawn's house that night, along with the other boys, and stealing some items. He also told police that a handle to a record player got broken while passing it along and taking it out of the house. He told police that he had hid the handle under a bush outside the house. He would go on to recant his statement, but remarkably, police found the handle at the same spot. Reportedly, one of the suspects also had the Nintendo which had been stolen from the house. He was trying to sell it, and his family recognized the Nintendo after seeing it in the news as an item stolen from Fawn's house. The family themselves reported it to the police, and all three teenagers were charged with Fawn's murder. However, a few months later, the charges were dropped after a DNA test from the individuals, compared with the DNA found at the crime scene, came out to be inconclusive. For years, people believed that the three teens were involved in Fawn's murder. The case would eventually go cold. In 2000, DNA found at the crime scene was entered into CODIS, but no matches could be found. The police would later re-interview the formerly juvenile suspects, who had initially been charged in the case, and obtained DNA samples from them. Detectives hoped advancements in DNA technology would link the three to the crime. However, the results conclusively confirmed that the DNA did not belong to any of the individuals. This finding was perplexing, considering one of the suspects was found in possession of the Nintendo stolen from Fawn's house. As years went by, Fawn's family lost hope of ever finding closure. In 2018, Fawn's family learned about genetic genealogy testing and advocated for it. However, police told them they did not have enough funding for such testing. Fawn's family offered to pay for the tests themselves, but the department did not allow them. The lead detective said in an interview that If one family can pay for something and another family can't, then, you know, we, we worry a lot about that. We, we want to serve everyone equally. In 2020, Kansas City Police worked with the FBI in order to secure funding, and the DNA found at the crime scene was finally sent for testing. Within weeks, the family received the long-awaited answer. On November 11, 2020, police finally revealed the identity of Fawn's killer, Donald Cox Jr. He was Fawn's older cousin, 
who was about five years older than she. He had frequently visited the family's home and was familiar with not only the family's schedule, but also the house layout. Donald also had a criminal record, which included misdemeanor robbery and possession of illegal substances. He died of a drug overdose in 2006. Because the death was suspicious, the medical examiner had investigated it and had kept a blood sample of Donald Cox, which helped link him to the crime. It remains uncertain whether the three individuals that were apprehended in 1989 were ever directly involved. Bond's family holds the belief that Donald did not act alone that night and may have collaborated with the three teenagers in burglarizing the house. However, only Donald was the one to set the assault and murder Vaughn. Some postulated that perhaps the three teenagers did not witness the murder, even though they may have been in the home. In a message to a podcast entitled Bitter Endings, the family expressed that they do not wish to pursue the case against the three individuals, but simply want to know the truth. The family said that while there is relief and some closure from this, the answers are not comforting. In 1993, Barbara Brodkin was a single mother living with her six-year-old son, Zachary, in an apartment building at 155 Balliol Street in Toronto, Canada. Barbara diligently juggled multiple jobs, going above and beyond to provide support for both herself and her son. On March 19, 1993, Zachary awoke around 7.40 a.m. and found the house to be eerily quiet. Barbara used to wake up Zachary for breakfast every morning, but she had failed to do so on this day. When she did not come to his room, Zachary went to look for his mother in her bedroom, only to discover a grisly sight. His mother was laying in a pool of blood near a closet in her bedroom. Horrified, the six-year-old managed to call the emergency services line. Police were dispatched to the Balliol Street apartment. Police entered the apartment just to find Barbara's lifeless body, just as it was described by the frantic six-year-old in the 911 call. Barbara had been beaten, strangled, and stabbed with a knife. In order to provide for her son, Barbara had resorted to selling cannabis and had kept a small quantity of it in her closet. Police speculated at the time that the motive behind her murder was robbery as a cosmetics case containing drugs and money was missing from the closet. Following an autopsy, it was determined that despite showing signs of strangulation, her cause of death was ultimately attributed to a single stab wound to the heart. Time of death as determined by autopsy led detectives to believe Barbara was killed sometime during the night while her six-year-old slept. The items in her room were scattered around, suggesting that Barbara had fought her attacker fiercely. Investigators determined that her attacker had trapped her within the confines of the closet during the assault. Law enforcement discovered DNA evidence beneath Barbara's fingernails, demonstrating that she was able to fight her attacker and scratch him with her nails, thus preserving his DNA. Law enforcement collected the DNA evidence beneath Barbara's fingernails and clipped and preserved them for future analysis. Despite interviewing Barbara's cannabis customers, no significant leads nor information emerged from those interviews. Suspicions would eventually fall upon her ex-husband, Christopher Barry. She and Barry had married in the 1980s. However, their marriage was far from a match made in heaven and the couple would go on to get a divorce. It was found that Barry had been violent and abusive towards Barbara. After the divorce, they became entangled in a heated custody battle for their son, Zachary, a battle which was ongoing at the time of Barbara's death. Barry resided near the mother and son and was suspected of verbally threatening Barbara several times prior to her murder. The Toronto police were confident that this would be a straightforward case and that Barry would be identified as the killer. Barry was brought in for questioning. He claimed he was innocent and said that he had been with his girlfriend at the time of the murder. His girlfriend corroborated his alibi. Despite extensive investigation and interviews, police could not link Barry to the crime. 
when the police requested a DNA sample from Barry to compare it against the DNA discovered under Barbara's fingernails, he willingly provided it. Barry died in 2009, with police still convinced he was the killer. Over the years, police interviewed nearly 300 witnesses, persons of interest, or those who may have had information about the crime. And although multiple suspects were considered, none were ever formally charged. Despite community engagement and concern, the case would eventually go cold. Then, in 2017, police reopened the case and resubmitted Barbara's fingernails to the Center for Forensic Science. A DNA profile was created from the DNA found under the fingernails and was entered into a database and compared with Barry's DNA. However, in what would come as a shock to investigators, the DNA test ruled Barry out as a suspect. Soon, the DNA would match one of Barbara's acquaintances named Charles Mustard. Charles Mustard was 37 years old at the time and was a former elementary school teacher with a lengthy criminal record. At the time of the murder, Charles had lost his job at a Thornhill school after being charged with eight counts of sexual assault. A day prior to his arrest, on October 18, 2018, Charles was asked to come down to police headquarters under the pretense of signing some papers. Unbeknownst to him, officers had arranged a display in the lobby featuring posters of Barbara, prominently displaying her name with the intention of observing his reactions while secretly recording the encounter. In the recorded video, he can be seen closely examining the photos. During his trial, Charles claimed he did not recognize Barbara in the photos. However, the judge called it a, quote, blatant and obvious lie, considering he had previously said he was her friend and had bought $50 of cannabis from her shortly before her murder. During the cross-examination, Charles told the court that while he now knew the photos were of Barbara, he did not know it was her when he was initially looking at them. At the time, Charles was unemployed and prosecutors believed he murdered Barbara to steal both the cannabis and the money, leaving in his wake an innocent six-year-old child forced to grow up without a mother. At his trial, Charles claimed to have been employed at a seafood restaurant in Barrie on the afternoon of March 19, 1993, with a shift spanning from 3 p.m. to midnight. However, he could recall neither the name of the restaurant nor the identity of his former boss. Charles protested the charges and claimed the DNA must have transferred from a joint he had had with Barbara shortly before her murder. He claimed that he had coated the joint with his saliva to prevent it from burning out and suggested that Barbara may have inadvertently picked up his DNA on her hand. Charles insisted he did not need money and that it was her abusive ex-husband who was the real killer. However, the prosecutor argued that he was unemployed at the time and that Barbara did not consider him a friend. The prosecutor went on to say that Barbara had never smoked a joint with Charles and further stated, quote, if she smoked a joint with mustard, why would she use both her hands? Moreover, Barry could not have been the killer as he had both a solid alibi and his DNA did not match the DNA found under Barbara's fingernails. The judge agreed with the prosecution. Barbara had scratched Charles in a valiant attempt to protect herself during the assault. This, they stated, was the only way his DNA could have been transferred beneath her fingernails, an act not done by the passing of a moistened joint. In April of 2023, Charles Mustard was found guilty of Barbara Brodkin's murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison without a chance of parole. Charles Mustard will be 83 when he is eligible for release. While the case was solved after 30 years, the family will never be able to replace the hole that Barbara's death left in their hearts. Sharon Pryor was a 16-year-old girl living with her mother in Point St. Charles, Montreal, Canada. Her family and friends described her as a kind, friendly, and reliable teenager who stayed out of trouble. Her sisters, who are twins, said that she loved animals and wanted to become a veterinarian. 
On Saturday evening, March 29th, 1975, Sharon spent her day painting Easter eggs for the upcoming Easter holiday. After having dinner with her family, Sharon left her home to meet up with friends at Marina's Pizzeria, as she often did on weekends. It had started to drizzle, and Sharon was hesitant to go out, as she did not want her suede jacket to be ruined. Her mother assured her that the jacket would be fine. A friend watched her cross the street in front of her home at around 7 p.m. The pizzeria was only a five-minute walk from her home, but she never made it. Her friends at the pizzeria assumed that she had met up with her boyfriend and had gone with him to his hockey game. Later that night, when Sharon did not come back home, her mother, Yvonne, became worried. Sharon often went out on weekends, but would always return home by 11 p.m., and she would always call her mom and say she was going to be late. Worried, Yvonne called Sharon's friends, but they told her that Sharon had never shown up at the pizzeria. So she called her boyfriend, but he had not seen her either. Yvonne reported her missing to the police. A search was conducted involving police, friends, family, and volunteers from the community, but to no avail. Yvonne went on TV, making a public plea for the safe return of her daughter. Four days later, Sharon's body would be found in a field at Chemin du Lot and Guimont Boulevard by a beekeeper. The beekeeper had received a phone call from a friend that his gate leading into the field was open. He would often close the gate as the field was sometimes used as a dumping ground. When he went to close the gate, he found Sharon's body and notified police. Sharon had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. She was found wearing her suede jacket, a sweater, shoes, and socks. Her jeans were found a few feet away, and her underwear were found on a nearby branch. An autopsy revealed that Sharon's time of death was around 20 hours prior to her body being found. It is believed that she had been held captive for three days before being killed. Police also believed that Sharon may have still been alive when her body was dumped in the field, as when she was found, she was clutching branches in her hands. At the crime scene, police found a tire truck about 15 feet away, suggesting that she was carried in a car before being dumped. Police also found a size 8.5 shoe print near the gate, suggesting that a person with a smaller build was involved. Police also found a man's shirt, which was used to bind Sharon at the crime scene. But this was a shirt of a larger man, weighing somewhere around 90 kilograms, or about 200 pounds, and most likely standing around 6 feet in height. Police wondered if two people were involved in the murder. Police were able to recover DNA from the crime scene. Sharon had a partial piece of duct tape dangling from her hair, suggesting that she had been gagged. In the course of their investigation, police discovered that just before Sharon's disappearance, a woman had been attacked with a knife in the same area earlier around 7 p.m. The assailant ran away after the woman screamed and some people rushed to the scene. Some speculated that the same man could have run into Sharon and abducted her while he was running away from attacking the previous woman. The woman who was attacked just before Sharon went missing picked out a man from a lineup but she was not sure if it was the same man, so the police had to let him go. Six years later, another girl, 12-year-old Tammy Leakey, disappeared just a few blocks from where Sharon had gone missing. Her body was found one day later. She had been raped, strangled, and beaten to death. An FBI profiler would later claim that the same killer or killers were responsible for both murders. For many years, a complete DNA profile could not be lifted from the clothing found at the crime scene. However, with advancements in DNA technology, a complete male DNA profile was finally created. In 2019, police sent the DNA profile to a lab in West Virginia. Soon, police found out that the person they were looking for had the family name of Romine. Armed with this information, the detective investigating the case, Eric Ransicott, searched tirelessly through databases that were connected to any prior crimes in either the area she was kidnapped or where she was found. He looked throughout public databases, newspapers, and any media he could get his hands on. And finally, he found a man named Franklin Maywood Romine, who had lived in Montreal the year Sharon Pryor was killed. Franklin lived only nine kilometers, less than six miles, away from Sharon. 
Furthermore, Franklin's physical description matched that of the individual who had attempted to abduct the 23-year-old woman on Wellington Street. Additionally, the investigator discovered that Franklin had owned a dark red Rambler with tires matching those that left a tire print at the location where Sharon's body was found. Franklin had an extensive criminal record in Canada as well as in the U.S. He was incarcerated for an unrelated crime in the West Virginia Penitentiary in 1964. In 1967, he had escaped from the penitentiary and moved to Canada, but within two years, he had already accumulated a criminal record there as well. In 1974, he was arrested for breaking into a house and sexually assaulting a woman in Parkersburg, West Virginia. After being released on a $2,500 bond just two months later, he fled again to Canada. Months after that, he would go on to murder Sharon Pryor. Only a few months following Sharon Pryor's murder in 1975, Canadian border officials apprehended Franklin Romine, who was subsequently extradited back to West Virginia. There, he received a prison sentence of five to ten years for the sexual assault committed in the Parkersburg case. Franklin was never considered a suspect in the case of Sharon Pryor. Unfortunately, he could not be charged as in 1982, shortly after he was released from prison for the Parkersburg case, he passed away in Canada. However, officials have been unable to locate a death certificate that provides details about the circumstances surrounding his death. His body was exhumed in April of 2023, and it was confirmed that his DNA was a 100% match to the DNA left at the crime scene of the murder of Sharon Pryor. Yvonne Pryor, Sharon's mother, is now in her 80s and still lives in Canada. She has spent her entire life searching for her daughter's killer. The family thanked police on both sides of the border for what they said was, quote, the miracle of science, which led them to the teenager's killer. Sharon's sister, Maureen, sums up the family's perspective on this now closed case. Quote, you may never have come back to our house or Congregation Street that weekend but you have never left our hearts and you never will. We love you, Sharon. Now may you truly rest in peace.